So they finally did it. One Piece was such a huge success, they didn't even hesitate to pull the trigger on another beloved series. Netflix said, we're going to take all your favorite anime and childhood memories and turn them into live action. What's going on, everybody? Your lovable judge here, taking a break from all the AOT editing I've been doing because you guys love the first one. But what do I see when I come out from under my rock for the past five months? Greed. They've managed to pull out a winner with One Piece. Everyone loved One Piece. I loved One Piece. My cousin, who was just now getting into One Piece, God rest his soul, loved the live action. You give Netflix an inch and they will take a mile. Netflix took all the feedback and momentum they made from One Piece and said, hey, we're gonna make Avatar the last airbender. And to everyone's surprise, it wasn't well received. Wasn't a good play. I'll say. No kidding. Horrible. You said it. But the effects were decent. What went wrong? How do we go from this to this? Well, if you look back on its development, the red flags are already there. The budget, the drama, the removal of character growth, the wokeness, the CGI, and more importantly, the original creators of Avatar The Last Airbender left the show due to creative differences. Hmm, this is all starting to sound familiar. Avatar The Last Airbender is a beloved show, and many people, me included, love the characters. It did the long journey perfectly. And to me, that's why the narrative was so strong. Because you could go from a simple warrior Damn, village to an underground secret police operation that brainwashes its unruly inhabitants to keep the status quo. It achieves this effortlessly in a way that doesn't over pollute the story at all. You're able to understand how different cultures and communities view the Fire Nation, the war that they're in, even if they believe it or not, and how they view the Avatar. This is one of the few stories that I personally would say is a masterpiece. But since that word is just so overused nowadays, let me clarify. It's not perfect. There are some issues that I have with one or two story beats that I will go over later that people have a legitimate problem with. But overall, it's consistent from beginning to end. It's a joy to watch because everyone on screen is having fun. From the boy in the iceberg, to traveling the world, to mastering all the elements, to saving the world and becoming the Avatar. And then they made the Legend of Korra. <laughs> It's complicated, all right? Besides, we're only talking about Netflix live action, okay? So let's not lose our cabbages just yet. Am I overhating on Korra? Possibly. Am I understanding how bad The Last Airbender was? Fuck no. No, I will not be watching Shyamalan's version, unless you ask me nicely. However, I am a fair judge, and everything I say going forth into this video is with the perspective that this is live action. Humans can't move like this without looking like this. There is in fact a budget, so get ready for some half-human hybrid homunculi on the screen at all times. And UA's hair doesn't look like a dick. Now, if you're in it for the long haul, I welcome you. Court is in session. So first off, let's go ahead and rapid fire some things off real quick, okay? Action. Now, in the show called Avatar The Last Airbender, how was the actual bending this time? Did we learn from my past mistakes? Does it still take 10 guys to do one dance to move one rock? Is the main character's name Aang instead of Ung? Is any of this better than the Shyamalan live action? Damn! He ain't gonna be in Rush Hour 3. Yes. Yes, it's actually good. Animation is always gonna be more creative, more fluid than any 50 year old can pull off. Not to say that they don't do their thing here. They do get it done, fantastically sometimes. And sometimes it's passable. And sometimes, you know, you get the, the hybrid on screen looking at you pretending to be human. And when the hype is real and it's time to go avatar mode, I'm hyped to sell for it. The effects are incredible. I give it an A. I think it's unfair to flat out compare it to the original animated version. I give it props for surprising me with this bending. Costumes. Let's fucking go, it's not a fucking penis. They're fine. Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they look like something I could buy off Amazon for $20. It's decent. Wigs are wigs. They exist. Uh, Talk, oh my God, what's wrong with your face? Hey, who told grandma to put this shit on, bro? You think you real funny, don't you? You say, oh, don't worry about it, grandma, it's fine. They ain't gonna laugh at you. They ain't gonna ridicule you on Good Sunday. 
Who lied to Grandma and co this? Got her out here looking like she just got embalmed. Grandma, get back in the house. I think we all know where this is going, so let's just skip to the end. The tone in the original was definitely lighthearted, with dark moments sprinkled in between. And this time, Netflix says, hey, we want you to take us seriously. Yeah! Sure, sometimes the original hinted at characters dying, but maybe like three or four actually died that are not relegated to backstory. That one goober from the original who tried to take on Jab with a spear and it was played off as laughs. Well, <laughs> he's dead now in the live action. Does it make sense that people died in wars and battles? Yes, of course. I can't tell you if this is a good or bad thing. I'm just as confused as you are. But again, I'm in this weird nebulous where I'm trying to tell you how many people die during a kid's show. But the only people I can hard confirm are dead in the original are Zhao, Jet, Yue, and Sparky Sparky Boom Man. Now, what we're all been waiting for. But let me stop you real quick. Before we start throwing some bricks at some kids, I'm not expecting Oscar level acting. My expectations were already low coming into this because it's live action and live action is live action. Do I really need to remind you of Dragon Ball Evolutions? And no, I won't force my cousin to watch this complete travesty. Listen, I'm trying to force my cousin to watch this. You know exactly what I'm trying to do here. Go on ahead, hit the like button. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The actors need some work, especially when it comes to showing anger or sadness. Now, again, this is very early. All this is subject to change. It could get better later on. But what can't get better is the awkward direction this adaptation is going for. Decisions were made behind closed doors that not only hindered the actors' performance of these characters, but just flat out don't make any sense. You have the Avatar Bible right in front of you. Why are you not using it? The only thing you're doing is making everyone feel off, like they're missing something. So let me first off say what I actually liked. Zuko and Iroh were perfect. Zuko is still that angsty kid, and Iroh has a smile warmer than the sun. The actors did an amazing job. And honestly, they're the only characters I feel like were themselves. These two felt like family, while others feel like co-workers. Does he still have funny moments? Yeah. Zuko had to stand there and watch as his uncle became a simp in real time. Iroh, no, you're old, bald, and lonely. She does exactly what she's doing. Don't let her win, Iroh. Back to the gym. You know who else knows what they're doing? Ozai. Damn boy, he's thick. Great choice, great motivation. Now this guy looks like he could bend backs. Somebody come quick. I can see this actor doing exactly what Ozai was doing in the original. I did like the fact that he fought back against Ozai in his flashback, but you can't convince me that young Zuko even stood a remote chance against Ozai. I'm sorry, show. Don't believe it. Momo and Appa look amazing, fantastic. But again, I know it takes two million just to have them on screen. So you know we're not going to get one of the most iconic anime fights of all time. It's just not going to happen. And that's it. Yep, that's it, all the positives. Now with that being said, I want sexism in my avatar. Now, let me explain. Aang is too boring. He doesn't feel like a kid anymore. They missed the point where Aang brings hope to the world with his kid-like nature because everyone else is just struggling to make it through the day. A flaw of being a kid is not wanting things to change due to responsibilities. But Aang found that balance. It took time for him to get there, but he found it. I know Aang's a monk, so he's always got something profound to say, but it comes off like one of those nicotine commercials. He's like a fortune cookie dispenser. Aang always took his job as an avatar seriously, but not this seriously. Also, they don't do this thing from the original. So this shit's mid. Let's go ahead and tackle the elephant in the room. I like Sokka. I really like Sokka. And the actor portraying him to me is spot on. The issue that I have with this Sokka is that he's lacking some character flaws. While yes, it's problematic and old fashioned and all these other derogatory words associated with that mindset, the cartoon never agreed with what he was saying. In fact, it actively showed him he was wrong. Sokka can have a terrible take on women, and the Avatar universe will promptly have him eating shit. I can't overstate how of a non-issue Sokka's sexism was in the original. But by the time he met Suki, that shit was squashed. Especially since Sokka was always pulling in that do-re-mi when it comes to the women. Go figure, right? The only thing you gotta do is be kinda sexist. Alright, big fella, why don't you toot that ass up on that bed? Hey, my man. I just came to do my time. I ain't waiting on uh, 
looking like a peanut butter Reese cup, and I need a piece. Bro, I don't know what you see, but I just came to do my time. You gonna do your time while getting hit from behind? Now toot that ass up! Bro, bro, you tripping. But because Sokka's sexism is gone, Katara loses her backbone and determined spirit. So after rewatching the original, I realized something. I had completely forgotten how much of an absolute unit Katara is. After getting trained in the Northern Water Tribe, Katara is able to go toe to toe with any bender, any earth bender, any fire bender, Zuko and Azula included. She has basically unlimited water sources. She can blood bend without the full moon. She's a well-written girl boss, but at the same time, everyone's mom keeping the squad together when it really counts. She's got attitude and doesn't mind telling you how she feels about you to your face. She threatened Zuko, told him if he acts up one more time, she's gonna give him the left, right, good night. In the live action here, I don't know what to say. She's kind of passive and somewhat timid. So seeing them dumb down the main trio is just sad to watch. It's like when these three are together, what are they talking about? It makes me wonder what they're gonna do with Toph when she shows up in season two. Then there's obviously a reason why the original creators left the show. Because someone was fucking with the material and said we're gonna do our own thing now. And that own thing is fucking Boomy. Boomy. King Boomy. Look how they mask with my boy. He's bitter now? He's angry at Aang for abandoning them? And he had to make some tough decisions that broke him? He went from this eccentric, kind of odd, but harmless friend to the Avatar. And now he's sobbing because this war has been beating him down to his mental health. And the show was taking itself way too seriously. I was genuinely getting secondhand embarrassment. Like, whoa, 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 hold on. I didn't like it because it was different. I didn't like it because it didn't make sense. All the airbenders got killed when the war started. So why wouldn't he just assume they got Aang as well? He should be thinking Aang is dead, laying in a ditch somewhere. Just for Aang to pop up and be like, hey guys, I'm the Avatar. Look at me do my airbending. He looks exactly the way he did 100 years ago. And Boomy doesn't ask a single question. Aang, how are you alive? Why are you so young? Are you some kind of body snatcher? I get what they were trying to do with the impossible choices. But Boomy wasn't the guy for that. If there was anyone who had been a better match for that topic, it would have been Roku, but he's too busy being a goofball to say anything meaningful. Azula. <laughs> okay, 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 listen, listen. What we're not gonna do is ridicule some 15 year old girl doing her best, and we're not gonna roast the other girls for looking like complete cosplayers. Now, I don't expect Azula's actor to pull off some shenanigans like this. However, when you think of Azula, you think of this shit. Yes. We defeated you for all time. You will never rise from the ashes of your shame and humiliation. Well, that was fun. <laughs> when I see Azula on screen, I want her to be doing some cool action shit. I don't need to know that she has daddy issues right off the jump. You don't have to tell me that show three times in a row. It was a death sentence to try to fight Azula one on one. But now it feels like she's one question away from having a mental breakdown. What's your relationship like with your father? So, for the final verdict, I can feel the love poured into this season. No matter what anyone says, I can feel the passion for the show. It comes through very clear sometimes. Because, oh, what's that show? You think you can slip in a Leaves from the Vine light motif and think I wouldn't notice? Well, I did. In the end, all that I would say that this is way better than 2010's Avatar. I don't know why people saying that it isn't. All it had to do was beat 2010, and I can say it passed it with flying colors. If you already have Netflix, go ahead and watch the original. It's right there next to it. Then watch the 2010 version so you get a good laugh at it, and then watch the Netflix version just to appreciate it and be like, ha, we've come a long way, haven't we? Now, if you remember, I said there was two issues that played the original series. Well, I kind of lied. To me, there's only one issue. But I know some of you watching this video are Zutara fans, so I'll bring it up. Aang and Katara's relationship is cringe. There, I said it, I got it off my chest. But guess what? I love the cringe. Give me more of that. Let me eat that for dinner. He's a 12 year old boy who never talked to a girl in his life. Gets frozen in the iceberg for 100 years. 
and the first girl he sees is an absolute baddie who's taller than him by the way what were you expecting for him to just walk up clap his hands and just get the girl nah bro we don't do that over here yeah! could there be a budding romance between zuko and katara i don't know but you're free to try to convince me in the comments would I have liked to see katara be more cringe with her feelings towards Aang? yes of course I'm a first come first serve kind of guy. However, I personally don't have a problem with this. My one and only problem with the ending of the original show is that Aang wasn't forced to make the hard decision to take out Ozai. Now, in my honest opinion, if Aang was forced in this situation like in Man of Steel and Ozai had to be killed, this show would have gone from a nine to a 15 out of 10. Now, hear me out, hear me out, let me cook. Aang is a vegan. Aang doesn't kill. Aang respects all life and at times shows amazing restraint until he does it because Aang did kill something after Appa got kidnapped. Aang, you do realize this was a living creature and you basically airbending sliced it out of the sky. Momo was safe flying right beside you. We were all good so you didn't need to execute that bug. Now you're probably saying Mark it was only a bug. No it wasn't just a bug, it was an enemy that needed to be eliminated no matter the cost, because Aang was angry. But Aang, that flying bug that you ultimate smashed to the ground, that thing is dead. If the wind slice didn't kill it, or the fall didn't kill it, then it's starving to death because it can't fly anymore, left to squirm on its belly in the hot, hot desert, definitely killed it. And then the show never addresses this ever again. But oh no, Aang's major hangup is that he doesn't want to kill anyone because he's a pacifist. Violence for necessary defense, and I've certainly never used it to take a life. You sure about that? All this just gives me whiplash to the Batman scene. But I remember what you told me, show. You told me this is what happened. Why are you just gonna pretend like you didn't say this? Either Aang has some serious case of amnesia or you just forgot what you wrote. But regardless, it doesn't ruin the show for me. It was sick as hell when Aang took Ozai's bending away. The lights were flashing, struggling against each other. Oh no, Aang's gonna get corrupted. Oh no, what are we gonna do, guys? And it's like, hell no, nah, I'm the Avatar, baby. Get your back bended, Ozai. And that's why Aang is the best Avatar to ever live, to ever do it. Way better than that, Korra. Am I right or am I right? Am I biased? But I also know that if season two doesn't pull in the number Netflix wants it to, that it's banking on. If One Piece gets canceled, Oda and the rest of the fans are just gonna sit back chilling because it's no skin off our noses. Oda is already in the works for his own spinoff story, which will add more episodes my cousin is going to have to watch. Somebody come quick, cause I don't think he's gonna make it. Someone pray for my man. He just got into the club and now he's getting personally hazed by the author. 